Welcome to my third episode in the Thoughts with Lachman podcast series. Um, in the first two episodes, I discussed nostalgia from East Berlin and the Berlin after the Berlin Wall was taken down. Um, specifically, what nostalgia means is it's really nostalgia for East Berlin, and it's like a specific term for that. And many East Germans missed. Um, products that they used in East Germany after the wall was taken down because those products in the communist market were widely available, but they didn't really survive in the capitalist market after the wall was taken down. And um, so, yeah, in the first podcast, I focused on East German nostalgia. And it's interesting because you would expect people to be happy. And they were happy after the wall was taken down, but there was also some um, nostalgia. Or nostalgia. Um, in the second episode of my podcast, I discussed foreign language in American schools during the 19th and early 20th century. So, just to give you a bit of background on that, before World War One and World War Two, 70% of American public high schools offered German as a foreign language, which is quite remarkable if you think about it. Because after World War One and World War Two, only thirty percent offered German as a foreign language, so it really shows the the impact of World War One and World War Two on what Americans thought of Germans, because there was a lot of German distrust by Americans after the war, and there's anti-German feeling in America. Um, so if you haven't listen to any of those podcasts i encourage you to do so my podcasts aren't necessarily in an order um so you could listen to episode three before you listen to episode one but i do recommend that you listen to those podcasts because i think the topics are pretty interesting and they also relate to what i'm going to be discussing in this podcast so today um we're going to be discussing German immigration into the United States and the impact it had specifically with kindergarten. Because kindergarten, um, it's actually a German word. And that's pretty cool. I never knew that before. I recently read and I found out that it was a German word, but um, it's, and it's not even like a, a word that's derived from German. It's just straight up the exact German word. So to start off, German immigration German immigrants into the United States, they were probably they were the largest group of immigrants into the United States. Specifically, we're gonna take a look from 1830 to 1900. So in American history during this time, this is really the Industrial Revolution in this period. And American manufacturing company, they, they needed workers because there weren't enough workers in America. The population was rising, and po America's population grew rapidly. And part of that was high birth rates by Americans, but it was also a lot of immigrants. And for many immigrants, America was attractive as a place because it had a reputation for political freedom, and economic opportunity. So m most people from other countries in Europe, when they were struggling, when they were very unhappy with their country, and they wanted to leave, America was a top option. Now from 1830 to 1900, the two major immigration groups into America were Irish and German. About 5 million Germans from 1830 to 1900 emigrated into America, and 3 million Irish. Now, the Germans and Irish were similar in that a majority were Roman Catholics, and for that reason, many devout Protestants who were native-born Americans distrusted them. And we even see a political party rise in America because 
they fear that these immigrants will take their jobs. It's called, it was known, the nickname for it was the Know Nothing Party, but it was, it was called the Star Spangled Banner Party. And many native born Americans do not trust these new immigrants. They feared that they would take their jobs. They didn't like the fact that many immigrants were Roman Catholics and they distrusted them. Yet German immigrants, between the two groups, German immigrants were more respected than Irish immigrants by Americans. And that's partly due to wealth and education. Germans tended to be far better educated than the Irish immigrants in the, into the United States. And some German immigrants were even better educated. Actually, many of them were better educated than many Americans. And many um, Germans, so the Irish immigrants that came into the, to the U.S., they came because of potato famines throughout the 19th century economic hardship. They wanted to start over. They, they needed a fresh start. They were struggling in Ireland. And America provided, that had a reputation, like I mentioned earlier, for being political, political freedom and economic opportunity. So that was the primary reason for many Irish immigrants. Now for German immigrants, it was very different. There were democratic revolutions throughout the 19th century in Germany that failed. And many liberal Germans who were educated and were really, who really pushed for these revolutions. And after they failed, they, they didn't want to live in Germany. They wanted to live in the United States. The United States had a democracy. So for both Ireland and the US, I think the government structure of the U.S. attracted German immigrants more so than Irish immigrants, and the economic opportunity in for financial success in the U.S. attracted Irish immigrants, um, because many Germans were wealthier when they came to the U.S. So for that reason, right, many Irish um, immigrants into the U.S. settled in cities like Boston and New York, and they lived in slums. They worked um, low paying jobs. They grinded. Many Irish actually eventually made up a large portion of the police force in major cities. And until they started gaining more political importance, the Irish struggled in America. And they really had to fight and grind their way. Now, Germans, they had it a lot better. Germans could afford to settle in the West. They could afford the, to the resources needed to travel to the West, to set up homes in the West. And that's really to, and that gave them more economic opportunity than the Irish who settled in slums and big cities. And um, when you take a look in the West, many Germans, there are a lot of Germans that settled in Texas. There are a lot of Germans that settled in Wisconsin and Milwaukee. And, as a, and Germans brought more so than Irish who tended to adapt more, to, more so to the American culture. Germans brought more of their culture with them. For example, beer is German. Now, German immigrants in the U.S. gain respect from native foreign Americans quickly. And this gave Germans the opportunity to make reforms that they believed in and that they had experienced before. So for example, like I said earlier, Germans were valued in education. Germans were one of the most, I don't, I don't know the right way to say it, but education is very important for Germans. 
and schooling really wasn't that i mean the first schooling in the north was moving along far better than schooling in the south you had colleges the first college set up in america this at this time it was in the english colonies it was in 1732 um harvard but schooling in the call in the it wasn't like pro progressing poorly but it wasn't progressing well and there were a lot of children who did not go to school and the interesting probably the most interesting part from reading about this that i found was that the german beliefs on how young children should be spending their time or not really young children but the german beliefs on children generally contradicted much of american society and it's interesting that an immigrant group really transformed really influenced an entire culture an entire society and they really you know put their footsteps on it they said they left their their lasting impacts they put their footprints not footsteps footprints on it because americans believe that children should work you know they consider children many adults many children worked in uh in factories for a long time in america in horrible conditions until unions became stronger and rose and they demanded you know less hours children under 13 couldn't work but Germans, so Americans believe that children should work. Now Germans disagreed. Germans believed that children should go to school. And this was a fundamental disagreement. Now Americans did believe that children should go to school if they could, but they were more so like, you go to school, but then you should also work after school. And they, G Americans did not believe that children should go to school at early ages. So there was a fundamental disagreement. But like I said earlier, Germans were well res respected by native born Americans, probably the most well respected out of any immigrant group. And this gave Germans the opportunity to at least state and push for reforms because they would be considered by other Americans. For example, the movement to make public schooling free from K to 12, well, not really free, but supported by tax dollars. So yeah, technically free. Consisted of many Germans. And specifically, you know, Germans were big believers that the young brain needed to be trained and molded. And at the time, there wasn't really, because then that's completely true, that the young brain, young brains, you have to train them, you have to mold them. And that's completely true. And Germans hit the nail on the head with this back in the day. But there wasn't any scientific evidence for this back then. And there is definitely evidence today, but so you might be wondering, right, if there's no scientific evidence, how did Germans just know that you no know, children had to go to school, had to have their young brains molded? And um, it's because of German philosophers who believed, who had educational theories. So if you look at, um, let's take a look at kindergarten. Like I mentioned earlier, kindergarten is, an, is a German word. A lot of people don't know that. I didn't know that, and I'm actually studying German. I'm taking a German, I'm finishing up a German 3 course. And yeah, kindergarten's a German word. 
kinder, meaning children, garden, meaning school, and a lot of people just assume that it's an English word, but, and it's most unique, like it's the straight, it, they just copied it. And you're one, you might be wondering, right, like, why don't, why is it called kindergarten for Americans when that's the German word? And it's because in the U.S. during the 19th century, the first kindergartens were exclusively German speaking. They were set up within German communities. They weren't, there was no government law or anything for them. They were set up within German communities and um, they were exclusively German. So, and they were well known, they spread. And then American, well, I mean, all German immigrants are technically Americans, but then other group, other parts of America started setting up these kindergartens. And because people knew that kindergarten associated, the word kindergarten, it associated with the German schools for younger children, they knew that. So there, there wasn't necessarily a problem. So that's why they called it a kindergarten because everybody knew what that meant. So now where did kindergartens come from, right? Because you, now we know, we already, I just said that um, many of the kindergarten, all of the kindergartens were exclusively German in the beginning. And what really drove that is that German philosophers had really spot on educational theories, completely spot on. And let's take a look at Frederick Frubel, because he's super important in this discussion with education. So Frubel was the founder of kindergarten, not in America, but in the world. He was the first one ever to create a school for younger children and call it a kindergarten. And Froebel's ideas really went against what many believed at the, at the time. Because most, like I said earlier, most parents believe children in the 19th century should work. and believe play was a waste of time. Now Froebel's educational theory and self-activity and play as essential factors in child education. And that's interesting because that's pretty similar to what we have today. Self-activity and play. Now self-activity just means exploring, figuring out things on your own. No one really dictating to you, do this, do that, do this, do that. But you are exploring, you're, you're learning on yourself, you're trying out new things. It's it helps your mind on that. And then play, it's using more fun activities for children to learn things. And activity too, like, yeah. So Froebel, you know, unlike many people at the time, Froebel believed that the role of the teacher was not to drill and indoctrinate children, but really instead to allow self-expression through play in individual and very important group activities. Froebel really emphasized group activities, working together. That's important because we see that today. And Froebel also wanted children, he wanted children really to learn by exploring, playing, singing, gardening. He encouraged learning through stories and observing nature. And he also created Froebelgaben or Froebel gifts. And these were really small, like building blocks and puzzles. And he believed that these were essential to understanding how the world worked. For example, like building blocks, it gave children a sense, an idea of the three dimensional nature of the world at, at a young age. So that's a clear, direct example of toys that you know, used by Froebel that helped teach children. Now, Froebel died in 1852, so we never really got to see the spread of his ideas, but they, they spread. By 1914, all major U.S. cities had a kindergarten program, 
Years before this, there were tons of kindergartens specifically with the German community because they had seen, they'd heard about Froebel's work. He was a well-known German philosopher. And um, his educational techniques in kindergarten and preschool today are really, I mean, his educational theories really are simple spot on to what's a lot of what's used today obviously i mean with schooling because if we think about child children's ed- education today part of it is tv shows i think that's a big part of it and i think they've done a great job with that because it's entertaining and you actually learn a lot part of it is definitely play part of it is definitely self-expression exploring things on your own making your own observations in your head, moving on. And, and yeah, and really teachers just guide you along for a lot of these things, but there's not a lot of, like, discipline in kindergarten and a lot of, like, do this and, and like enforcement of everything. And it's really interesting that his educational theory, how this all started, right? Because if we take... A look, right? Just a recap. So, first, we have Froebel's educational theory. And I have no clue how he formed his educational theory. I did a lot of research to see potential influences, but I think he just made observations throughout his life. I think he must, he worked with children. He was a teacher. So, he worked with children throughout his life. So, I'm assuming that he probably made observations. He tried out different techniques and he saw what worked best and didn't work. Um, so, but really, if you take a look at it, so it started off with Froebel's educational theories, and that started off from his own observations with teaching children. Um, and then you, then this spreads specifically among the German community. You have a lot of German immigrants that come to the United States. They set up these kindergartens because they have a contradictory belief. And because... German immigrants were well-respected in the United States. They could push for what they wanted. And Americans were, they saw what Germans were doing. They respected it. They thought highly of Germans, of German immigrants. If, for example, Irish were doing this in the United States, it would would have been different because Americans viewed Germans and Irish very differently at the time. And I think that's interesting too. And then Germans set up, these kindergartens, German word, Americans copy it directly, and they become widespread across the United States and across the world. And today, every single child in America does that has access to a public education, goes to a public education, and goes to a kindergarten. And um, yeah, I think it's really interesting the fact that an educational theory from one philosopher had the power to just completely transform the world and the process by which it did the slow process of first with immigrants german immigrants the small schools in their communities i think that's really interesting and i so yeah that that brings us to the end of our podcast i hope you enjoyed listening today um, just to recap today's podcast we started out by talking about the first and second podcasts that I made on East German nostalgia and German immigrants in the U.S. with public schooling. If you had not checked out these episodes, I strongly recommend you to do so. Like I said earlier, my podcasts don't really have to be watched in order because I discuss different top, a different topic in every podcast. And I give context on the topic in case you have no prior knowledge. We discuss the today we discuss the contradictory beliefs between society and Frobel on young children and also another German immigrants on young children in society and, and their role in society and what they should spend their time doing. And then we dived into Frederick Frobel's educational theories and how that led to the formation of kindergartens in German communities and then widespread across the US. Thank you for listening to this episode, and I hope you listen to many more in the future.